The 2006 Stolen Valor Act, which makes it a crime to falsely claim you're a war hero, faces a major test today. So today, Eric, the Supreme Court will hear arguments claiming the law violates the First Amendment right to free speech. Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano joins us with his take on what the Supreme <laughs> Court will do today. Good so morning, you have guys. this gentleman right. who dresses up in a military uniform and medals and speaks at public events saying, hey, I was a veteran, but right. he's not. Now that yeah, uniform is a costume. It looks like a real uniform, and those medals are false, even though they look like uh, real medals. The question is, can the government prosecute him and punish him for this form of free speech? And that's what the Supreme Court uh, will decide today. So the government's argument is that the military uh, is, consists of volunteers and they risk their lives to keep us safe. We should protect them by not mimicking them and mocking them, and we shouldn't let someone steal their, their heroism and falsely claim it's his. The lawyers for this fellow claim, hey, it's a matter of free speech. I can mock the military, I can mimic the military, I can even falsely claim that I was in the military because all this is protected by the First Amendment. Now, as, as reprehensible as his behavior is, in my view, it is seriously protected by the First Amendment. It's the very nature of what the First Amendment was intended to protect, which is mocking or ridiculing the government. But Judge, if he's not uh, ridiculing or mocking, um, you know, First Amendment, free speech versus fraud, and then comes to mind, what if I put on a police uniform and walk on the street? Well, that's a different uh, issue because a police uniform would cause people to uh, respond to what you say. Uh, I'm a cop, let me see your driver's license, registration, insurance, or whatever else the police would say to you. That's independently already against the law, as is fraud. L let's, let's not um, uh, carry the free speech argument into the area of fraud. If this guy goes to an employer and says, you're looking for an ex-military person uh, who uh, d demonstrated heroism under fire, that's me, and the employer hires him, and then the employer loses clients because this guy can't do his job, that's fraud, and he can pay for that fraud. But showing up at a at a town meeting saying I'm an, I'm an ex marine is perfectly protected free speech. Think about it this way: How could the government make it a crime to lie? If that were the case, many of the people who voted for this could themselves be <laughs> prosecuted. Well, let's because, not go down that path. Because that's how they got into office no, but, by lying, a, including about their so-called military past, uh, like Senator Blumenthal in uh, in uh, Connecticut. Exactly. So, but that's an interesting point to make. Because there is a fine line here. Yes. And the Stolen Valor Act only came into being in 2006. You say it was a direct result after 9-11? Yes. I think it was, it was an effort, a legitimate effort by the Congress uh, to protect uh, returning veterans uh, from being uh, mimicked or having the, the honor of their sacrifice and service diluted by frauds and phonies like this guy. But the government, as it sometimes does, went too far and forgot that this guy does have the right to mimic and even lie about the military if he wants to because the First Amendment protects that. Judge, what do you, how, what do you think? How's this going to turn out? I think the Supreme Court will invalidate uh, the statute. This has been a very, very pro-First Amendment Supreme Court and it has allowed some horrific speech to be free, like movies about killing animals, uh, in, in deference to the First Amendment. I think that's the same way they go here. Remember, he was convicted. The conviction was overturned by an appeals court, the infamous Ninth Circuit in California, and then the Supreme Court decided to hear it. I think they took this case because they think the Congress went too far. All right. Very interesting. You heard it from the judge's mouth. We'll now see what the Supreme Court does. I'm, I don't always, I'm not always right well, in these predictions. You're one of the smartest guys in the building, so I think I'll go with you. Thank you, Judge. So kind. You. Have a nice day, guys. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court saying it will take on affirmative action once again. The country's highest court will discuss whether it is constitutional to consider race and ethnicity when admitting students. The court will hear the case of a white student named Abigail Fisher, who claims she was rejected by the University of Texas, uh, Texas based on the color of her skin. So, is there a chance affirmative action is on its way out? Judge Andrew Napolitano joins me now to weigh in on that. Stuart. So, this case will be taken up by the Supreme Court. Is there a chance that the court will rule eventually and say, 
No more affirmative action. No more use of your birth characteristics to get into college. Stuart, I think there's more than a chance. I think there's a probability that the Supreme Court will do that. The, the case on which the lower courts dismissed Abigail Fisher's complaint is a 2003 Supreme Court case involving the University of Michigan in which the then Supreme Court, Justice O'Connor breaking the tie and writing for the majority said, you know, even though race is not supposed to be taken into account by the government when it makes decisions, we've fought a civil war and we have a 14th Amendment and, and the law has been pretty consistent since then. We're going to allow universities to consider race as long as by considering race it makes the university more diverse and therefore makes the student's experience a richer one. So it can consider race. It can be a factor in an admission. Yes. Would this case say, no, I it can't even be a factor. It cannot be considered. Yes, I think it will. The court has a different makeup now. The swing vote is now Justice Anthony Kennedy. By swing vote, I mean the person who frequently breaks the tie between the four liberals and the four conservatives. Justice Kennedy dissented in that University of Michigan case back in 2003. Oh. So if he, if he votes when they cast their vote, the same way he did just a few years ago on facts remarkably similar to those which faced him a few years ago, it will be five to four or five to three, Justice Kagan may, rec may recuse herself, to invalidate the ability of state-owned universities to take race into account in admitting standards. By the way, there was a huge cheer at a recent Ron Paul meeting. Over what? Over, <laughs> don't be so aggressive, this is good for you, <laughs> where um, he suggested, maybe jokingly, I don't know, that you could be his vice presidential running mate. What's your response? I couldn't afford it. You would, I, I thought you were going to give a, a William Tecumseh Sherman response. If drafted, I will not run. If nominated, I will not accept. If elected, I will not serve. I think he is the antidote that the Republican Party needs, but there are a lot of hoops through which he has to jump before he'd be in a position to choose a running mate. What kind of an answer is that? The answer you asked for. <laughs> Judge Napolitano, always a lawyer at heart. Stuart, I started my day with you and I'm ending it with you. <laughs> for you. me, that is a good day. <laughs> Thanks, Judge. <laughs> Yesterday with Hughley, the jury yeah. found no premeditation, no intent. Yeah. And in this case, no evidence to suggest the murder won. Judge no Napolitano's intent. coming in now because we, we really hadn't anticipated this. We, we, weren't, we were prepared to discuss this topic today, obviously, <laughs> but we never dreamed, Judge, that the, the, when the motion is made, uh, we, we motion for dismissal that it would actually be dismissed. Who, we never even considered that. It, it rarely happens in American jurisdictions, as, uh, as counsel can tell you. I think maybe I did it twice in my entire career on the bench, and that's a lot to do it in your career. Particularly in a criminal case, the rule of thumb is to let the jury decide. Yep. Uh, judges really only throw out criminal cases when there is no basis as in zero basis from which a jury could find guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. They are supposed to do that when there is no such basis. Mm. So it would be unusual for this judge to let it go to the jury and then decide, well, there really wasn't a basis, I'm going to throw it out. There just wasn't enough there. The judge is like, you've not made a case, that's it. Look, you could argue that the case shouldn't have been brought at all because they already served time in another jurisdiction. It doesn't appear as though it was adequate punishment for what happened there if he was guilty of the crime, but he did plead guilty to it uh, over there. Their system is entirely different from ours, and if the crime occurred, it occurred in another country. You could make that argument. But now's not the time to make that argument. That argument should have been made and advanced and ruled on before the case began. The system has spoken. The man is not guilty. He has spent 18 months in prison for a crime that the law has now said he did not commit. I'm told I got an email, but it hasn't come through on the BlackBerry. If you guys want to tell me in my ear, I'll repeat it for the audience. But uh, and then they don't. Uh, judge, uh, follow up to come on this after 18 months in prison. If you didn't do anything wrong, you lost your wife. That man's in, that man's in, a, in a hurt place. I would think he's in a very uh, bad situation, although he's probably relieved because he'll walk out of that prison uh, a free person this afternoon in a most unexpected and unanticipated way. You can see the excitement amongst yeah. us. We're professionals who live with this. Guarantee you his lawyers did not think this was going to happen. No. Guarantee you they were ready to present a defense. <laughs> Well, taxpayers footing the bill once again, mortgage lenders Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac <clears throat> racking up tens of millions of dollars in attorney's fees to defend several former executives charged with fraud. The bad news, uh, this comes after taxpayers have already spent $183 billion bailing out 
those mortgage giants. Back to Gretchen. So is there any recourse? <laughs> <laughs> Joining us is Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. All right, we, so a we, lot of people are going to be upset with this. I but... know, I know. People are going to be upset, and they have a right to be upset. I mean, the federal government has created a mess, A, by getting into the housing business in 1938, which was when Fannie was started, and 1970 under Richard Nixon, which was when Freddie was started, and then entering into agreements with the officers of these corporations, which once were wholly owned by the government, then were uh, traded on the public uh, stock exchanges, then are back wholly owned by the government, entering into agreements that we will indemnify you, we will pay your legal defenses, and we will pay any judgment against you. That's over a hundred million dollars so far, and there's no budget there. That money will just keep flowing to the lawyers representing these guys. So why do you, uh, why, why the taxpayers the only option to bail out? Is that why everyone feels helpless about this? There, there was a time when the taxpayers guaranteed Fannie and Freddie. So if Fannie and Freddie was making money, then no money came from the taxpayers. But Fannie and Freddie just lost 183 billion with a B. So the government's attitude is, what's another hundred million? Uh, the, the taxpayers are suffering terribly. They're on the hook. There's no way out of this. There's nothing Congress can do about it. Congress should not have gotten in the business of housing in the first place. The Constitution doesn't authorize so it. So is it true that you believe that they should have tried to settle to save some of this taxpayer money? I do. I do. You see, you can't sue Fannie and Freddie directly because the Congress has enacted legislation that makes them immune from litigation. So you sue their officers for the judgments that they made, and the government ends up defending the officers. It's almost the same thing as if they sued uh, Fannie and Freddie. But when you have legal bills of this magnitude, in a case you were certainly likely to lose, and the tide of public opinion against you, and the economy not going the right way, settle the case get it over with. But they're not going to do that. No, no, they're, they're, they're not going to do this, and the lawyers will get rich. I'm not critical of the lawyers. Lawyers would kill to have this case. They're doing a good job representing these guys, but the cases, and there are many of them, are enormous. Right. They, they, they could last another 25 years. And they're still oh. giving out loans, though. Yes, they are still giving out loans, Brian. Imagine that. An entity that's bankrupt, $183 billion, is still lending money to people who will never pay it back. That's what Thanks happens. Thanks for that positive That's note, what happens Judge, when the federal Friday. government gets into a business, housing, that the Constitution doesn't authorize it to get into. Right. How dare you criticize Richard Nixon? <laughs> <laughs> Have a good weekend, Sorry, Judge. Sorry, Mr. President. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for your insights. We'll see you Pleasure, Monday. guys. A very big story, John. Seven states banding together on a controversial issue, asking to join a federal lawsuit blocking the government's mandate that religious organizations must offer health insurance coverage, including free birth control. Texas, Florida, Michigan, Nebraska, Ohio, Oklahoma, and South Carolina calling on a federal judge to declare the law unconstitutional despite a recent accommodation we heard from the president. Let's talk to Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Napolitano. So, Judge, we've heard about this as a women's health issue, right. a religious freedom issue. Yes. Is it a state issue? No, it's not a state issue because the Constitution requires that in order to bring a lawsuit in federal court, you must have what's called standing. Standing means that you have been uniquely harmed by what the defendant has done. So who would be harmed here? A Catholic employer would be harmed who would be forced to purchase health coverage that violates the teaching of the Catholic Church. For example, the Archdiocese of New York, which employs 10,000 people. The University of Notre Dame, which employs 15,000 people. They would be ideal candidates to bring this lawsuit. Suit, but not the state of Nebraska. The Attorney General of Nebraska may ardently believe that this section of Obamacare is unconstitutional, and I agree with him. But he doesn't have the right to go into court and complain about it. Now, all is not lost here because there already is a case, and the plaintiffs in the case are Catholic schools that do employ Catholic uh, employees, and they do have standing to sue. But the court is going to say to these states, go back home. Interesting. So let's talk about the case that is going forward, as yes. well as the fact that we have the Supreme Court taking a look at health care, and we expect a, a ruling on it in June. How do all these cases come together? Because health care, the health care law is being implemented as we speak. Yes, it is. 
the Supreme Court is going to look at a challenge to the individual mandate, that is the requirement in the health care law that every person in America have or acquire health insurance, whether they want it, whether they need it, whether they can afford it or not. If the Supreme Court in April, when it hears this case, just two months from now, decides the individual mandate is unconstitutional, that will effectively invalidate the entire statute, including this obligation on the part of Catholic employers to make available to their employees something that the Catholic Church uh, teaches against. So let me ask your legal expertise on that. What do you let go first? If you were looking at these cases and they're all challenging the health care law, which gets the priority? How do you develop the other cases if you're still watching the Supreme Court case? Okay. I mean, how is that all done? Unfortunately, all these cases were not filed at the same time. And the cases challenging the individual mandate were filed a year and a half ago, so they have made their way to the Supreme Court. The cases challenging the obligation to provide contraception services were just filed in the past two or three months. So it will be two or three years before they get to the Supreme Court. In the best of all worlds, the Supreme Court would have all the challenges to every part of Obamacare before at once but that's just not the way human nature and society works so it's going to take them as they get there but the individual mandate is the linchpin to the entire statute without it there's no funding for the statute and the other parts will probably fall and be impossible financially to enforce we began 2012 with the health care law in place being implemented do we end the year with the health care law in place as well Jenna Lee are you asking me to get in the mind of nine Absolutely. Supreme Court justices I will happily percent. do so <laughs> five to four unconstitutional why you do you have say it right that? Here. Why do you say five to four? Because in preparation for many of my uh, commentaries on this, I have read what these justices have written on other aspects of a just a very small clause of the Constitution called the Commerce Clause, which is the clause that lets Congress regulate interstate commerce. And in my view, the way the swing justice, Justice Anthony Kennedy, has viewed the Commerce Clause in the past, he will not vote to extend it to authorize Congress to force you to engage in interstate commerce. And he will be that fifth vote against it. I'm not always right in this, Jenna, so, you know, don't, don't, tape, don't take though. this to the bank. Save the tape. <laughs> That's it. February 24th. We're going to save it, Judge. Thank you so much. We're going to continue to Pleasure. look at different parts of this law. Thank you for kicking us off today. Pleasure, guys.